Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Chuck Collins, senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where he directs the program on inequality and co-edits inequality.org. He's an expert on U.S. inequality and on the racial wealth divide. Collins is the author of several books, including 99 to 1, How Wealth Inequality is Wrecking the World and What We Can Do About It. Born on third base, a one percenter makes the case for tackling inequality, bringing wealth home, and committing to the common good. And most recently, is inequality in America irreversible? Collins gave a talk titled Reversing Wealth Inequality, The Case for Restoring Progressive Taxation and Bringing Wealth Home on April 17, 2019, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2018-19 SEDEC Lecturer. His talk was part of the Common Good series. Thank you, Chuck, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. So um, why don't we start, go back, and how did you come to be focused in your work on inequality? What, what got you there? Well, from a personal point of view, I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Detroit. I actually grew up in a, in a wealthy family, perched on the border uh, of Detroit, Michigan. And so I <clears throat> lived in a town that had an enormous inequality between inner city and suburbs, white and black, rich and poor. So I think that was my youthful uh, experience. And then I think you know my own coming of age kind of corresponded to this period of growing inequality. So you know I started paying attention maybe in the early 80s and just noticing you know how wages were flat for most people and wealth was growing. So I had this f intimate front row seat to how inequality was growing in the United States. So tell us, give us your assessment of what the current state of inequality of economic disparity is in the U.S. Well, we're in a moment of extreme inequality, of income, wealth, and opportunity. And it's, it's probably only paralleled by, maybe by a century ago during the first Gilded Age of the United States. Um, but we're basically at a time where now we're four, over four decades of stagnant wages. Uh, half the workforce has really not shared in the economic gains of the last 40 years. And then we are seeing wealth and income go not just to the top 1%, but the top one-tenth of 1%. And the higher we go up the economic ladder, the more concentrated wealth is becoming. Uh, and it has an impact on everybody and everything we do. Um, the, you, know, you, you ask, how is that possible? And you know, one out of five households today has zero or negative net worth, nothing to fall back on. So uh, it's just really the story of our time. Can you give us some perspective on, so, so what was it like in the mid-20th mid century yeah. in comparison? Coming out of the Depression and World War II, uh, you could almost say we were growing together as a society. The bottom fifth of people and the top fifth all grew roughly at about the same pace. Uh, there was an expansion of a middle class. Uh, the rules of the economy were oriented toward shared prosperity, um, expanding home ownership, uh, more people going to college without debt, uh, investments in infrastructure, all those things. So we, we essentially had 30, 40 years of shared prosperity, really. And then come the late 70s, we started to move in the opposite direction and start to pull apart. So one of your areas of expertise is the racial wealth gap. So how have people of color, how, how are they doing relative to, to uh, white people right now? Well, the, um, people of color in that period after World War II mm -hmm. also started to make gains, but in the 40s and 50s and 60s, the, some of those programs that helped white Americans get into the middle class were uh, you know, racially discriminatory, so people of color didn't join. Mm -hmm. So we're now in a situation where there's this overall inequality dynamic and I think of it as, as kind of supercharging the racial wealth divide, which obviously goes back hundreds of years, mm -hmm. whether it's slavery, Jim Crow, separate and unequal, all the way up to housing discrimination up to the present moment. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a situation now where the median wealth in this country you know, went down, say, 3% over the last 30 years. But for African Americans, it went down almost by half, meaning ha they have half the wealth uh, adjusted for inflation that they had in 1983. So even though incomes are starting to rise for African Americans and, and uh, Latinos, wealth, which really tells us a different story about sort of well-being over time, wealth, the wealth gap is growing. And why is that? 
Part of it is that after the economic meltdown, um, most black wealth was in the form of home ownership, uh, and white wealth was more diversified, mm -hmm. so uh, wealth, white wealth recovered faster. Um, that's one reason. Uh, but it really is about the sort of multi-generational of legacy of, of racism and wealth building. Um, and I can think even in, you know, after World War II, I had an uncle who bought a farm uh, with a 35-year, 1% fixed rate mortgage from Farmer's Home. Uh, that, that was like a, a huge boon to get on the wealth train. And many uh, people of color were barred from getting on that wealth train. Mm -hmm. So um, you've begun to gesture in this direction, but um, so what's led to this in inequality? How has the structure of the economy changed so that we get inequality in wages, assets, and opportunities? What's, what would have been the specific changes that have happened? If I were to summarize it in a bumper sticker, it would be that the, the rules of the economy have been tilted to benefit asset owners, mm -hmm. people who own wealth, or investors, mm -hmm. at the expense of wage earners. Um, so tax policy, trade policy, government spending, all those are, think of them as rules or dials on the machine, they've all been tipped to benefit wealth owners. And, and so if you do that for 40 years, you end up with the situation we have now, which is extreme inequality. Then we get a situation where now wealth is so concentrated at the top that it's starting to distort the economy, uh, that the very, very wealthy are using their wealth and power to further tip the rules of the economy in their favor. So it sort of becomes almost like a, a, a vicious cycle. So if I were to describe the physics of inequality today, it would be compounding advantage at the top mm -hmm. and accelerating disadvantage for everyone else. Can you specify a little bit the nature of those disadvantages? Well, uh, I think of them as the, 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 the corollary to what we did 40 years ago. Uh, it's harder to get a living wage job. It's harder to save. Uh, it's harder to go to college without graduating with substantial debt. Uh, it's harder to get into the work, workforce. And it's harder for younger people to purchase homes. Uh, so it's, it's like a steeper climb in each aspect of what used to be a little easier opportunity, per particularly for white Americans. Why do you think that Americans continue to believe that economic success and social mobility are, are sort of the result of merit and individual activity. Why, why are they unaware or um, unoffended by the kind of structures that you're describing? Well, I think there are some people who believe that, but I think that uh, that story is starting to crack up, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, I think we had a very high tolerance for inequality uh, 15 years ago when most people believed that there was social mobility mm -hmm. and that if you worked hard and played by the rules and that the rules of the economy were fair mm -hmm. and therefore uh, where you are, where you end up has to do with your own you know, behavior, your own hard work, et cetera. Now we're starting to notice there's starting to be a shift there because more people understand A, that their social mobility has stalled out, mm -hmm. meaning there isn't the same no matter how hard someone works in the bottom or the middle, they're not moving forward. And more and more people believe that the rules are rigged in favor of the very wealthy. So uh, while that story of deservedness or meritocracy is incredibly powerful, uh, I think more and more people are questioning uh, it and realizing that th their own circumstances may not entirely be their own effort or they're, they're, com they're encountering barriers or obstacles that are beyond their control. So that helps to explain the kind of rise of uh, right and left wing populism that we're seeing now. Yeah. The story about everything's being rigged, those are the very terms that the current president uses to describe. Um, in your assessment, has his uh, economic policy addressed that rigging? Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Paul. People who voted for Bernie Sanders on the progressive side and Donald Trump on the conservative side would share that view that the, the rules of the economy are rigged. And um, I don't think that uh, President Trump's policies are unrigging those policies, meaning, and, and, and really the case in point is the tax cut that passed at the end of 2017, which was pretty much a trillion dollar tax break for 
some global corporations and the very wealthy. And as people are discovering this, this uh, tax season, not a lot went to ordinary working people. So that could have been, an, could, there, there are many ways that uh, we could have reoriented the tax system. And in fact, it, it further rigged the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a lot of people voted for the president in the hope that he was going to disrupt that system. And I don't think he's really, dis he's disrupting things, but he's not disrupting the rules that reinforce inequality. So let's talk, let's begin to talk about how we might respond to this. Yeah. So first, let's start with, there, there are all these other first world nations that have a very different kind of income or a situation than ours. Okay. What's different about those places than here? One big difference is they have a higher floor, uh, a floor of decency or a social safety net uh, through the people cannot fall. So they have a higher minimum wage, they have universal health insurance, they have lifelong learning and education and retraining. So if you lose your job, uh, you get ill, uh, you get divorced, you don't kind of fall all the way to destitution. And so one reason they have less inequality is they have a higher floor. They also make more public investments in things that allow for mobility and opportunity. And they also limit or restrain the concentration of wealth and power at the top. So they just have a, a narrower uh, gap between top and bottom. Um, so, so we hear, you know, when people say, well, how can we, you know, look at, look at, look at France, look at, you know, look at all yeah. these other countries, things are different there. Uh, why don't we change our tax code? Why don't we change yeah. our economic rules? Um, and we hear that, no, 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 you can't do that. It's class war. Mm -hmm. It'll cripple the economy. Everything will go yeah. in the tank. But that's not the case in those other countries, is it? No. And in fact, the United States, in a sense, was on track, you know, in the mid-70s, we were on track to be like one of those societies, like a Nordic country, where we would have had considerably less economy. I mean, we had created Medicare. We had created uh, a higher minimum. The minimum wage was higher. Uh, we were doing things to expand opportunity for people of color in the, you know, late 60s and 70s. And we, we made that wrong turn. The fact is those are healthy, dynamic capitalist societies. They have less inequality. They have less economic insecurity across the society. And they're also very pro-work and pro-enterprise societies. Uh, the rates of entrepreneurship uh, in the Nordic countries are much higher per capita than the United States. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It means that you don't have to have a family safety net to take a risk. You, c you know the worst thing that's going to happen if you put your business idea in place and you f if it goes belly up is you'll go back and get free job retraining with a stipend so you can retool yourself and get back in the workforce and pay your taxes. So they're, a, they're, they're, they're healthy and we should take a look and learn from them. I mean, there are things that are relevant to the United States and some things that aren't, but we should be more open and, and learn from other healthy uh, societies that have less inequality. And these are capitalist societies. These are yep. not uh, centralized economies. They're not cap uh, yeah, these are not communist countries. Command, state owned. There's vibrant private sector, vibrant you know, corporate sector. Uh, there are billionaires, uh, but those billionaires are gonna pay a little bit of more taxes. But many of them don't resent it because their children also go to college for free. Their parents, uh, they don't worry about their long-term health care. Uh, they know that their neighbors are not destitute and afraid of economic insecurity, and therefore the, the common good in that society is more supported. So what are some of the things that could be done to reverse this concentration of wealth and power at the top? Well, building on our discussion, I think there are things we can do to raise the floor. Mm -hmm. We could have a higher minimum wage. We can expand health insurance. We, can, we could replicate that decency floor, and that's a wildly popular set of ideas. Uh, also, we could restore the progressivity of the tax system uh, to what it was under President Kennedy, even under President Eisenhower. It was much more progressive. Uh, the highest incomes paid higher rates of income and inheritance taxes, and it was invested in public goods that created opportunity for others. Um, I think it's outrageous that young people today graduate with the level of student debt. There's no positive element to the economy or society. Uh, I was talking to a friend yesterday who said she paid her $512 student loan bill and the principal went down $12. Uh, that is just unacceptable. 
And it, I think the most important thing for us to remember is it doesn't have to be this way. We can, we can organize the economy. We don't have to sacrifice freedom. We don't have to sacrifice entrepreneurship or the healthy aspects of private enterprise. But we could organize things to have a much better society for not just the wealthy, but for everybody. So you've suggested that a uh, higher minimum wage is wildly popular. Certainly the students at the University of Oregon would be delighted if yeah. their debt load was lightened. Yeah. If these ideas are popular, why don't we do them? Well, I think we're in a situation now, particularly at the national level, where our, where our political system is captured by the wealthy donor class. They, they, and essentially what that does is it blocks change. So the pressure from below is building. And some of that's expressing itself in states. So there's a move in California, a college, California College for All campaign, to restore the state's inheritance tax and direct the money to low cost or free higher education in public institutions. And there's an idea that probably will become the law in California in the next couple of years. And you can see that in other states as well. So pressure is building in states. Uh, another example is um, particularly coastal cities are experiencing intense affordable housing crises. Mm -hmm. Some of that is just global wealth coming in, pushing up the cost of land and housing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, empty luxury buildings in our coastal cities, whether it's Seattle, San Francisco, Portland, where I live in Boston. Uh, we call them wealth storage units. They're just empty, vacant storage units of wealth. Let's tax those transactions, tax their transfers, and invest that in permanently affordable housing. So these are all ideas. So my, I, Paul, I see a, a realignment happening. I see some pressure building. Uh, it may not all work out, but I think that we're wide, there's a wide recognition these inequalities are bad for everybody. We don't want our society to continue to be kind of a apartheid society and uh, that it's in our power to reverse that. So I think the next couple of years, I'm hopeful that we will start to shift the, the direction uh, of where things are going. So let's talk about some more specifics. One of the things you talk about in the recent book is um, disparities between corporate executive pay and workers' pay. So give us some historical perspective on that and, and how that might be remedied, that disparity. Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of the kind of startling statistics around inequality is like 1965, the average CEO and top manager of a company in the United States was paid about 20 times the lowest paid worker. Uh, now it's over 300 to one. And in some companies it's over 1,000 to one. And uh, one of the weird things is we as taxpayers subsidize that because businesses deduct their compensation, all forms of compensation, as a business expense. So there's several proposals to essentially say, uh, let's cap that deduction or any compensation, say over 50 times the average paid worker in a company is no longer a tax deductible business expense. Um, and actually Oregon took the lead, uh, the city of Portland passed an ordinance that companies that uh, I think have a gap over 100 to one have to pay a higher uh, municipal corporate income tax rate. So uh, now even cities and states are beginning to say we don't want to subsidize excessive pay. It doesn't seem possible that CEOs now are 100 times smarter than CEOs from the 1960s. No, that's probably true, <laughs> nor a 1,000 times. You know, and if you think, well, it, it, that's an it's an example, though, of a distortion because, you know, you and I may have different, you may get up two hours before me and you may work harder and smarter, and you should be rewarded for that, you know? Maybe twice as much or three times as much compensation. But 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, it's no, longer, um, it's no longer a proportionate to the differences in our efforts and talent. So you mentioned uh, raising the floor, yeah. but another thing you talk about is leveling the field. So talk a little bit about how that might be done. Well, uh, you know, one part of leveling the field right now is just defending our democracy and uh, you know, protecting our democracy from the influence of money in politics, because that seems to be what's upending things. But I think investments like uh, things that create opportunity. Uh, so we talked about higher education as a great example of that. Um, but you know, even things that uh, uh, you know, we have a public K 
K through 12 education system that's largely supported by local property taxes, the wealthier the community, the more is it invested in education. So you start to have this unlevel playing field just simply when it comes to elementary school. And there are things that we can do to get, stop paying for education through the property tax system and pay through it through other forms of taxation. So there are things like that that just sort of, you know, ensure that everybody has the relative equality of opportunity when they get into the into life in the workforce. And and are there particular things that could address the racial wealth divide? For specific strategies that address that problem? Yeah, um, I think there are things that we can do, like raise the minimum wage, or let's say create a first-time home buyer loan program that would help disproportionately help people of color because of their historic exclusion, but wouldn't necessarily be uh, sort of a race, racially targeted program. It could be a universal thing mm -hmm. that helps people. But that said, there are things that we probably should do to deal with this you know, century uh, uh, legacy of discrimination. There's a proposal, um, uh, one of the candidates for president, Senator Cory Booker, has proposed this idea of baby bonds. So one of the things that makes inequality grow over generations is families help their kids, parents help their kids. Uh, sociologists call it the, you know, the intertransmission of intergenerational transmission of advantage, which is just a fancy way of saying helping our kids. Well, if you're in that wealthiest, say 10 or 20 percent, there's all kinds of things that parents do just in the course of. But if you're not wealthy, uh, you don't have a f college fund. You don't have a fund if you, uh, to help you get your first month's deposit. You can't borrow money from your parents to get a down payment to, to purchase a home. Um, so the idea is to create essentially kind of an endowment account. Every individual when they're born, put you know $1,000 in this account and money goes into it. And then by the time somebody comes of age at 18 or 19, they have a little nest egg that they can use to pay for their education or start a business or purchase a home. So there are, there are things like that that if they were, had been implemented 40 years ago, the racial wealth divide would be significantly narrowed. Um, I should say we just did a report called uh, 10 Solutions to Bridge the Racial Wealth Divide where we sort of did an inventory of that and people can find that at inequality.org which is a little website that I co-edit. Um, but uh, we, we identify a whole bunch of solutions. Another one is, um, uh, what we call postal banking. The idea is uh, a lot of, uh, there's some 10 million households that are unbanked, uh, don't have access to bank accounts, and are prey to predatory lenders. What if the Postal Service, which happens to be in all rural areas and many, you know, every, everywhere, uh, provided check cashing services, small uh, financial services, and essentially small savings accounts mm -hmm. for unbanked people? Uh, so that they don't have to go to payday lenders and predatory lenders to, to get their checks cashed. So there are things like that that could protect low-income people from the sort of predatory aspect of the banking system. Are there things that individuals can do? I mean, as like you and I? Yeah. Well, you know, there are, there are, I think one thing is actually to try to tell true stories of how advantage works. Mm -hmm. um, because. In the end, we need to change the systems and the rules. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, but in order to do that, we have to go back to what you talked about earlier. We have to sort of change the stories and recognize some people were able to go to college for free. Some of us had help from our families to purchase a home. Uh, not everybody has those advantages. So telling those stories. As white Americans, you know, I benefited from the wealth building programs after World War II and my African-American friends' grandparents did not. So let's at least become honest with one another about how advantage works. That's something that each of us as individuals can do. We can think about our own stories and narratives. Some of us have had adversity and challenges, but to the extent we've had help along the way, we should, we should talk about that. So you, when you say that the, where the wealth is now concentrated is not in the 1%, but in the, 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 the top of the top, and in fact, I can't remember the number that you quote in the book, but there's like 20 people, you know, who yeah. are, that own most of the wealth in, in the world. Yeah. Um, so we have proposals to raise 
luxury taxes, uh, you know, taxes at 70%. Yeah. And the, the, one of the counter arguments is, well, you don't need to tax those people because those people are philanthropists. They mm. do great things with philanthropy. What's wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, um, one good thing about philanthropy is we, we have this vibrant independent sector, private institutions and charities that are, are important. But let's just remember, philanthropy is not a substitute for an adequately funded public sector and a fair tax system. And for every dollar that a billionaire gives to charity, you and I are chipping in anywhere from 35 to 50, 60 cents of that dollar in lost tax revenue. Mm -hmm. So we now are starting to see a situation where the wealthiest people in the society are opting out of the tax system by, cre by giving to their own private charities that give to their own priorities. It's not, it's not a democratic alternative. And um, you know, taxes are the way in which we pay for things together and we democratically decide how those funds are used. Sometimes those decisions are warped by some people have more power than others. But um, so I'm in favor of maintaining a healthy philanthropic sector and the independent sector that it supports, but just we should restore a tax system and we should make sure the philanthropy isn't sort of an end run around paying your taxes. So we just have about a minute left. This will be my last question. Are you optimistic that the kinds of changes that you are, are you're talking about could in fact be implemented in the next decade, the next 20 years? Well, I do have uh, you know the dark nights of the soul where I worry that things could continue to continue to polarize. Mm -hmm. But I actually, when I meet young people today, when I meet people on college campuses, uh, and I see this this kind of undercurrent of social movements emerging, I'm very optimistic. I actually think that in the next five years we will begin to see some of these inequalities reverse. Uh, I think it will require a bold discussion about the power of concentrated wealth and taxes that actually diminish that power because that will be part of how we rescue our democracy in this moment. But yeah, I actually, I actually see all these uh, positive signs emerging around us and, uh, and gives me hope. Well, on that optimistic note, I want to thank you, Chuck Collins, for talking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Paul, for having me. I've been speaking with Chuck Collins, senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where he directs the program on inequality and co-edits inequality.org. Collins gave a talk titled Reversing Wealth Inequality, The Case for Restoring Progressive Taxation and Bringing Wealth Home on April 17, 2019, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2018-19 SEDEC lecture. His talk was part of the Common Good series. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.